because, you know, my favorite quote about entrepreneurs is if you want to understand an entrepreneur, study the juvenile delinquent. <laughs> because they're, they, they're basically saying, oh, this sucks. <laughs> I'm going to do it my own way. So when I was young, I, uh, I, I invented my own sports, pretty much. I mean, I, I could play baseball as well as the other kid, and, but when it came time to a, for a real game and people watching, I would just clutch up and fumble the ball and everything. And so I basically spent a lot of my childhood down in uh, the LA River from Burbank. And uh, I was down there, you know, gigging frogs and catching crawdads and eating them and that kind of stuff. And uh, in fact, we used to swim in this, this is in grammar school. We used to go down and swim in the outfall from Walt Disney Studios. And it was the outfall from the film developing labs. <laughs> so <laughs> if I ever get cancer, it'll probably be from that, I guess. You know, the first, first after you trap a wild bird, the first thing you do is you put them on your fist with these Jessies and he flies off and you put them back on and he flies off and put them back on. You keep doing that until finally he sits there. And you, you stay up all night until he finally falls asleep on your hand. That's a real quick way to build trust in the bird. And you know, that's my kind of first lesson in Zen because the Zen master would say, all right, just who's getting trained here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so from climbing to Falcon's Iries, um, I learned to climb mountains. And uh, in those days, there were very few mountain climbers around. And all the gear was made in, uh, in Europe. And the, the pitons that you drive into the cracks to protect yourself and stuff, were made out of soft iron, and they cost 15 cents a piece. And the Europeans' attitude towards climbing mountains was you conquer the mountains, you know, the conquest of Mount Everest, this kind of stuff. And um, so they left the pitons in place. You'd do a first ascent. You'd leave all your gear in place to make it easier for the next person. It's kind of like manifest destiny, you know. You, you make the mountains democratic so that the weakest possible person can get up it. <laughs> well, we, we read a lot of the philosophy of the transcendentalists, you know, the Emerson and, and uh, Thoreau and, and John Muir especially, and so, who believed that y you climb the mountains but you don't leave any trace behind. So we wanted to make, I, w I wanted to, I mean, I was 18 years old or something. I wanted to make some pitons that were made out of harder steel that you could put in and take out and leave no trace of having been there. So that's what I did. I borrowed um, some money from my parents and I bought an anvil and a forge and a book on blacksmithing and I became a blacksmith. And I sold my pitons for a dollar and a half each, 10 times what they were going for. But it was pretty obvious after a while that you, if you wanted to do the hard climbs we were doing in Yosemite, you know, these 10-day climbs on El Capitan and stuff, you had to have these pitons because you, you had to carry like 30 of them and use them 300 times in the course of 10 days. So I was making a product that people had to have. Um, after a while, there got to be so many climbers putting in and taking out these pitons that they started, I started noticing that it's destroying the cracks. Where there used to be a little thin crack, now there's a big hole. And I realized, oh my God, we caused this. So even though making pitons and stuff like that was a big part of our business, we decided to phase that out. And thankfully, we came up with some ideas for these little aluminum chocks that you just place with your fingers and you take out with your fingers and it doesn't damage the rock. And uh, so we switched over completely to that. Uh, you know, 
destroying the cracks was just an unintended consequence of a technology that we were responsible for. Well, it was hard at first to convince climbers who were used to pounding these pitons in with a big 20 ounce hammer to trust that little piece of aluminum that they put in with their fingers. So we had to lead by example. And so uh, myself and another guy went and climbed a route on El Capitan without hammers and without pitons, just to show that uh, if you could do that, you could climb anywhere safely. And I never intended to be a businessman. You know, this is in the 60s. That's when, you know, businessmen were grease balls. <laughs> so I, I just happened to be a craftsman that, uh, you know, every, every time I looked at a piece of equipment, I had an idea on how to make it better. I'm kind of an innovator. I'm not an inventor. It's like the difference between invention and innovation is uh, invention is one is zero to one. Innovation is one to 1,000. And so over the course of years, I, we basically redesigned every single piece of climbing equipment, made it better. So it got to be pretty successful. I had 80% of the climbing business. Um, from this little black blacksmith shop. And another Zen lesson that I learned is that uh, um, you climb a big wall like El Capitan, you get to the top, there's nothing there. <laughs> <laughs> there's no photographers, there's no uh, dancing girls. There's <laughs> so, What's important about climbing is it's a purely idealistic thing that has no worth to society whatsoever. <laughs> and what's important is how, how you climb. And uh, so I, that's a lesson I learned in business as well, that uh, you don't focus on making a profit. You focus on all the process of making a profit. And the profits will just happen. And it's the same thing with climbing. If you focus too much on getting to the summit, you'll blow it, you'll compromise on the way up and, and uh, 